And today, I'm going to go over the Dhamma in the Sabhasala Sutta. I mean, this is familiar to some of you. And it may have a greater meaning now that we're in a meditation course. And I think it's quite useful because, uh, as the name suggests, Sapa means all. It's sort of a comprehensive uh, practice or a comprehensive instruction. It's also interesting of note for those of you who are have questions about what the Buddha taught on meditation and whether what we're doing here is what the Buddha taught or that sort of thing. We hear the Buddha teaching about other things. But sutta is like a sabhasana sutta and there are many of them offer insight into a regimen of practice rather than describing sort of the rote sequence of events that occur as one practices going through the jhanas or gaining magical powers or what the Buddha talked about. Those, those suttas seem a little bit more lofty and, and designed to impress because they talk about things that certainly the Buddha didn't expect everyone to gain. Not everyone who practices the Buddha's teaching will gain all of the various um, formless jhanas or magical powers or that sort of thing. But you find suttas like the Sabhasava Sutta are much more down to earth, grounded, talking about actual means of practice. So the Sabhasava Sutta is about seven different uh, ways of removing or abandoning the Asava. Asava is an interesting word. You shouldn't read too much into it. It seems like kind of a poetic word. It probably had uh, it was much more familiar to the people the Buddha was addressing than it is to us trying to translate it literally. Because asava has something to do with flowing. So like a stream. Or like a, a flow. But that's not how it's used. It's used something more like oozing. It's definitely got a negative connotation of Maybe not oozing in the sense of something disgusting or putrid, but like a leak. The sense of a, a vessel that shouldn't be exuding uh, liquid, but is. If you have a leak, if your mind is leaky, you can think of it in that sense. Because if your mind doesn't leak, then it's very well contained. Seeing is just seeing, and it works properly. But when a machine is leaking, like if your gas tank is leaking, or your, I don't know, what parts of the car leak, I don't know anything about cars, uh, then you got problems. So if your mind is leaking, the asava leaks. But I said you don't have to read too much into it because it's really just another name for defilements, for corruptions of mind, for qualities of mind that are uh, irrational, that are based on delusion. See, the whole idea of evil in Buddhism has to do with, to some extent, irrationality. And what I mean by that is not bringing the result it, it hopes for. Why do we have greed? Well, because we think craving for things, when we get them, we're going to be happy. Well, it turns out that's not true, so it's irrational, it's, it's inconsistent. Wholesomeness is good because it's consistent. It brings about the, the desired effect. So 
So the corruptions of the mind is what is being talked about, things that lead to suffering. But quite simply, we call it we call it bad because it leads to suffering, because our definition of suffering is, well, things that you don't want. So if you're doing things that lead to things you don't want, you're inconsistent. The only way you could do that is through delusion. You couldn't say, I want this, so I'm going to do something that doesn't get me this, or gets me the opposite. You couldn't do that if you had clarity about what you're doing, of course. So when you free from yourself from that inconsistency, it's the freedom from defilement, that's the idea. So how do we practice uh, to, to overcome this? And obviously the first one, you should pay attention because there's a connection here. The first one is called dasana bhattava. The overcoming or the, the abandoning, the destruction of defilements by dasana. This word dasana uh, occurs quite often in the in texts. And if you don't know Pali, uh, you might miss the connection with what we're doing. What we're doing is called, what we're practicing is called vipassana. Right? Vipassana means seeing clearly. Dasana. Dasana and basana are the same word. I bring this up because uh, there's often a concern that vipassana is something uh, niche or maybe something modern. You say, the Buddha didn't teach us vipassana, but everywhere in his text he's talking about seeing. And the word dasana is the exact same word as basana. So the Buddha says the first way to overcome our uh, defilements or to get rid of them stop leaking, is through seeing, the first way. And in fact, the, the bulk of the sutta is on this first one. So this is a really good sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number two. It's right at the beginning of the Majjhima Nikaya, which kind of says something. It's one of the big ones. The first way, and the, the main way to overcome them is seeing. Seeing which is exactly what we mean when, or what the Buddha meant when he said vipassana or vipassati, seeing clearly. So seeing here, of course, is not seeing with the eyes. That's not what he says. And he goes on to talk about how a person who doesn't see clearly is the implication because everyone sees, right? Everyone experiences. But without clarity, there's misunderstanding. You conceive of a self, this is me, this is mine. Without the practice of mindfulness, we identify with our experiences. You come into this course talking about how you have this problem. I have this problem. I am this sort of person. I, this is my, I know. My pain my suffering, my stress, my anxiety, my addiction. And as you practice day in and day out, you start to see a little more clearly. And your perspective on the experiences changes. There's no longer this narrative of me and mine. And the whole of our practice is about cutting through this, this delusion and this fuzziness, the darkness, so that we see that our uh, thoughts and our experiences, our physical and mental experiences are, well, it's not even just to, to, to give rise to the thought that these are not me, not mine. It's just the clarity shows you experiences. There's no, there's no room, there's no indication, there's no label on your cup that says, you know, adder. No. That's not a, that's not a criticism of adder writing on his cup. I tried to write on my cup, but it's 
a good idea, but um, it, there's there's nothing there's nothing really uh, in our experiences that that uh, indicates self. So the absence of self isn't isn't something you you, you realize intellectually. It just disappears, right? All of the problems that you cling to and say, this is, I have this problem. I'm angry. I'm in, I'm in pain. If someone else has pain, you don't cry and, and wail and moan about it, right? If someone else's house is on fire, well, maybe you feel bad and you go to help, but you're not sad about losing all of somebody else's things. So much suffering comes from this identification, wrong view of not not things so much as experiences, right? Losing or or the fear or the, the stress that relates to our possessions is one thing, but that relates to our mind, that to our body, the stress that comes from pain and the fact that we conceive of it as a, as as mine. That's really it. When you see clearly, pain is just pain. Because that's what it is. The thing that's gone wrong is these uh, conceptions of self and so on. They come from lack of vision. So this is what the Buddha, he talks at some length about how someone who doesn't see clearly, who hasn't trained, who hasn't undertaken to practice mindfulness, they don't see clearly, and because they don't see clearly, they, they give rise to views of self, and so on, and they suffer. But someone who does see, who practices what we're practicing, this is why we call this practice vipassana. You're not actually practicing vipassana, but we call it vipassana meditation because that's the goal. There are other types of meditation that don't allow you to see clearly in this way. But this one, you start to see more clearly about uh, all of the things inside of you and in the world around you, all of the aspects of experience. And that clarity frees you from the asava. It's like you've stopped up a bunch of leaks and suddenly, oh, you're a whole again. So that's the majority of our practice and really the, the essence of the practice of mindfulness. The rest of the sutta it's quite interesting in that it's practical. So I think it's a good thing to talk about at the beginning because it'll help you with some strategies and some sort of philosophies or, or outlooks, how you can deal with certain issues that come up in the practice. The second one is samvara bahatava, that some aspect of our, our problems uh, can be solved by guarding Somewhere means guarding or restraining. Restraining is not the greatest, but it has a meaning because what this refers to is restraining or guarding the senses. And so restraining the senses does actually mean things like don't go looking around at everything, right? Don't go listening to try and hear something. Don't go looking for smells or tastes or feelings. So when we walk as meditators, try to walk looking at the ground, even when you're walking around. It's not because you're unfriendly or, or but this is one time where we don't actually have to engage with each other. No one expects it. We know you're not being unfriendly. It's an opportunity to keep yourself so you don't leak. This isn't the practice, you see, but it's helpful. When you're dedicated to clarity, you want to be careful that you don't get overwhelmed. Because if you just let yourself take in everything, you know, it's easy to lose mindfulness, get caught up in reactions, and you start leaking all over the place. 
So as a support for the practice, especially in the early stages, it's quite useful to guard your senses physically, right? Don't go near things that might uh, trigger your, your extreme emotions. When you take food, this is why monks, when they eat, they put everything together. Put it all together and mix it all up. Because, you know, otherwise you might easily get caught up in, oh, why this food is good. Cheesecake is good. Pasta is good. Soup is good. But when you mix it all together, it's just food. It's easy to get distracted with things like food, smells, good smells, bad smells, sounds. But ultimately, um, I think the best advice, that's good advice, but the best advice for the senses is to not let them overwhelm you. Basically, not forget to be mindful. Because, of course, it falls under the mindfulness. You can be mindful of all your senses. But they are easy to get overwhelmed by. People talking about hearing the noise in their uh, neighbor's kuti. It's easy to uh, start to obsess over that. Now, certainly, it's distra distracting. But a part of that, the problem there is our conception of meditation as being peaceful. We're, we're fixated very often, very much on this calm. And there's nothing wrong with calm. It's usually a good sign. But it's not the end goal. And it's not uh, valuable in and of itself. It's not something to seek out. When you notice yourself getting calm, it is true that you should think, okay, yeah, I've never had that before. That's a sign that I'm clearing out some stresses and so on. But when you don't feel calm because you're constantly disturbed by things that you have to note, that's not a bad sign. And the problem isn't those distractions. The problem is you think, how can I possibly be calm with all of this going on? You understand that's not the... It's easy to get obsessed about such things, right? Obsessed about uh, good things, bad things. You can even get obsessed about thoughts. Thoughts is one of the six, one of the senses. It's the sixth sense. You can get very obsessed about thoughts. Maybe someone said something. Maybe I said something, and you're not just don't agree with it, or you're not sure about it. You just think it's upset, or maybe one of the other meditators, or Maybe you're thinking about something you said in the past, or you did in the past. Right? It's still one of the senses. So the real guarding, the most uh, important guarding, comes through mindfulness. And it's just a reminder that the senses are a part of mindfulness, are an object of mindfulness. And something that you can very easily get overwhelmed by, obsessed by. Don't let them be, become a problem. Because you'll get into it and you'll think, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. You have to check. Is it one of the senses? Okay, then I can be mindful of it. Along with all of your reactions, of course. So that's somewhere about Number three is called Patisevana Bhattava. We patch up the leaks through Patisevana, which means using. Using is in regards to our requisites. And this is something that's stressed over and over again for monks. Monks are, are repeatedly taught, uh, or the Buddha repeatedly would, would uh, teach to the monks about the four requisites. And it's something as a monk that we try to be very aware of. And every day, monks will chant these reflections to remind yourself to be aware of your use of things. So the four requisites are clothing, food, uh, dwelling, and medicine. The idea is, this is a, a basic idea of the sorts of things that everyone needs. They're the necessities of life. You can extrapolate this to everything that you use, but 
you can probably see that as during your stay here, you, there isn't a lot more than that. You don't have cars that you have to drive, you don't have phones that you uh, have to use. We really don't have much more than the four requisites, so we have clothing. You don't have, you, when, when you're at home, this probably has a lot more of a meaning to you because you can choose clothes. But choosing clothes for the right purpose, right? Because even a, monks, a monk can become enamored with his robes. Robes can be quite beautiful and so on. And uh, one of the reflections that we do is the reminder of the nature of clothes. How the nature, how, what nature? The nature that when you wash your clothes, they're very clean. There's nothing dirty about cotton or wool or anything. But as soon as they touch the body, they begin to become dirty, become disgusting. It's a good reflection. Because we become attached to our possessions. We become enamored with things like a telephone. You can be quite happy that you got the latest telephone or something. A car, you know, I love my car, it's 2021, 2022 car. So these kind of reflections, the Buddha noticed that, you know, when you pare everything down to its minimum, if you have cars and phones, that's where your attention is. But for monks, if all you have is your robe and your bowl and, and, and medicines and so on, you get very much attached to them. There was a monk who got so attached to his robes, because the mind is like this, whatever it has, it gives rise to this. And you'll find during the course, maybe not so much with clothes, but maybe, uh, that you become very much attached to them. Oh, I love this shirt, or these pants, or whatever. So the reminder, there was one monk who was so attached to his robe that when he died, he became a louse, or a lice, a little insect on his robe. I guess they had lice before he died. <laughs> One of them gave birth to him. So there you go, the lesson. Don't get attached to your clothing. Um, food is a very common one, probably more easily relatable. The food here is probably very, is, you think most people, it's very good, no? We have a dedicated chef who puts lots of love into his cooking. And so the food is very good. Very easy to, to become attached to it. On the other hand, you're not eating a lot. You're only eating in the morning, and so you might become very attached to food that you would normally eat. Maybe you want a cheeseburger, or pizza, or cheesecake. It's very easy to become obsessive about these things. So a reminder of what food is for helps us to uh, see the sort of the craziness of our mind. We might rationalize and think, well, you know, I, I, I'm used to this kind of food or something. You know, I should have food that I'm used to or something like that. And you remind yourself, no, no. What if food is just for living? I don't need to become fat or uh, gain energy or I don't have to enjoy the food. It's not an entertainment. Food is something that over time can become a, quite an obsession. As you crave in the evening when you're hungry. Uh, reflecting on food, especially when the food is good, you know, reflecting on what it's for and reflecting on the nature of it as you feel it in your mouth. When your teeth are pulverizing it and co coating it with sweat. There's a, an entire meditation on the repulsiveness of food. And it starts with the, the going to get food as being, oh, if only I didn't have to go and get food, right? Prepare the food for people who aren't monks. But after preparing the food, you know, preparing it, um, and you put it on a plate, and then you pick it up with your hand, because in the old days, well, let's say you have your fork, and your fork's already been in your mouth, so you stick your fork in it. And at that point, nobody wants to share it with you because your fork's been in it. Now it's disgusting. 
so it, it reminds you of, you know, how food becomes disgusting, which is kind of silly because it's not that big of a deal, but then it goes in your mouth. And before it had been in your mouth, someone might say, well, I'll share it with your plate. But once it's in your mouth, you can't take it out and give it to someone else. It's disgusting. And then you chew it up and mash it into a paste and your tongue pushes against the food and rolls it around and coats it in your cheek cells and tongue cells and, and saliva. And you got this mush. And then you couldn't pull it out of your mouth and give it to someone. It's revolting at this point. But even then, it's still food. Once it goes down your throat, coating in your throat with oil and you know, slime, then it gets to your stomach and it, it's cooked in your stomach and uh, dissolved in your stomach and squeezed through your intestines and then it comes out the other end and nobody would want to have anything to do with it then. We reflect on this. I'm not suggesting that you go through all of that, but it's a good reminder for us to notice how we become irrational. This is this kind of attachment to food is kind of silly. Food, the Buddha said, it should be like medicine. We take the food and, and our plate is like a medicine pan. So in the old days, they would have herbs and they would mix the herbs up in a pan for medicine. And he said, your plate, your bowl, it will be a bowl. It is like a medicine bowl mix up the medicine and you eat the medicine because you have a sickness and that sickness is hunger. So you have to every day take your medicine. That's how food is. Uh, then shelter or dwelling or dwelling. This is a important one because this includes our bedding and you have very comfortable beds actually considering you know when I first started meditating back in the old days, um, I think I was, I, I think I maybe made a mistake because I just took whatever they gave me, which is not, it's, you know, it's kind of noble, but it can be noble stupid in a way. Like, they just gave me a very thin, lumpy uh, mat thing. It's like the cheap, cheap thing that you get that's like it's got cotton in it so it's a mat but it's lumpy so some places have no cotton some places have big lumps of cotton and then I was given a room with a wooden floor and so I had to sleep on this mat and I couldn't sleep the only way I could sleep was lying on my back and that's all we had and a pillow a small pillow as well but I found out later that some people asked for a second mat or a third mat or so. So I think that would have been... Uh, it's not to say that you have to be uncomfortable when you sleep, but having a bed is quite a luxurious thing and can be dangerous if you're not careful, which is why the Buddha said to be careful with things like this. It's very easy to fall prey to the pleasure of lying down. It's something you have to be vigilant about, mindful about. The other aspect of dwelling is the privacy. So in the privacy of your room, you are not accountable to anyone. Right? When you're in your room, when you come out, maybe you walk around looking very mindful and you think, oh, everyone sees me being mindful. But then you go back into your room and just throw off the yoke. That's a danger of dwelling as well. So even when you're alone, you have to remind yourself, I'm not doing this for anyone else, this is for me. When I'm alone, I will be as mindful as when there are people watching or when I'm around other people. We have to reflect on this danger in, 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 these, in the requisites, including our dwelling. And the fourth is medicine. And I think the biggest thing about medicine is the overuse of medicine, especially things like painkillers. It's common in some places for meditators to fall into using painkillers to get rid of headaches and uh, backaches or whatever kind of ache. You know. So it's not that you shouldn't use medicine, of course not. Medicine has a purpose and you use it for that purpose. You just don't uh, become addicted to it. Painkillers should be used sparingly. 
but it's just overwhelming. With the idea that, for pain especially, eventually you can try to bear with it. So medicine is something to be aware of, we need it, but it's very easy to become dependent on it and, and sort of um, knee-jerk, even if reactionary when you're using, taking medicine as a means of solving your problems. So that's all together in regards to using and, and as, again by extension this can go for everything, you know, the timer that you have, don't get attached to it, um, everything in your life, all of your possessions when you leave and it comes to cars and so on. But, but uh, the next one is Adiwasana Bhaktava. Adiwasana, Vasana means uh, dwelling, adi means uh, on, and well, what it means is uh, bearing with. Adiwasana is another word for patience. And this is an important outlook, important, important reminder for us that uh, some one aspect of our freedom from defilement, of our patching up the leaks in the mind, is patience and bearing with experiences. It's, a, it's unfamiliar to us most of the time. We're not taught to bear with our experiences. We're taught solutions to our problems, right? So the Buddha said, what sort of things should we bear with? We should bear with insect bites, we should bear with cold, we should bear with heat, we should bear with hunger and thirst, we should bear with anything that is not a true danger to our physical or mental well-being. So you're not going to die from an ant bite, right? to die from hunger, and you do have food every day, or thirst, the cold will not kill you, the heat will not kill you. We're so used to finding a solution, when it's cold, turn up the heat, when it's hot, find the shade, go for a swim. But this is a new perspective on things, to try and bear with unpleasantness. And of course, of course, the most important is pain. And the Buddha said in this sutta, something that is an answer to a question that we often get. How much pain should you endure? The Buddha said, you should endure pain, even pain that feels like it might kill you. I don't know if he meant to say that even if it's going to kill you, but there wouldn't be any surprise if he did, because if you can get to the point where you are patient even to something that will kill you, something that is deadly, then you have come to the point where you're free from any attachment. It's a very powerful state. You have to judge for yourself you know, whether that's a good thing, but I don't actually think that's what he meant here. It means pain that is just unbearable, excruciating. You know, that it feels like, like you're going to die. Because you don't, I think, die from pain. But there really is no limit to how much pain you can endure and still follow the Buddha's teaching. That's really the point. And for the most part, our pain isn't a problem. It's, it falls into this category of things that we're used to trying to fix that don't actually hinder our practice and in fact become a very important part of our practice, important part of our, re, uh, our, our shift of perspective from seeing things like pain as a problem to seeing 
things like pain as an experience. So a reminder to us to be patient and to bear with these things that probably, even though you've started to meditate, you found it hard to bear with and tend to avoid. So I'm not saying that you, you, you can't turn on the heat or so on, but uh, you can move, you know. But keep in mind that a part of the practice, it's going to help you if you can be patient. Think of it like that. Try and see the value in being a little more patient than you might normally be. Adivasana. From these that let's see. Dasana Samara Pakisuyana Adivasana. The next one is Pariwajana. Pariwajana is in contrast to Adivasana. Pariwajana means avoid. There are things that you should avoid, that you should run away from, that you should get rid of. And these are things that do have the potential to cause uh, a real problem in your practice, like a snake. If there's a poisonous snake, you should avoid it. If there's a crocodile or an alligator, you should probably avoid it. Don't go swimming. Don't go swimming in the pond. Or maybe don't go sitting next to the pond. I don't know. Don't go running through the forest at night. If I don't come in the morning, I was you, know, you might you might start to wonder. Are there bears in the forest? Uh, but try your best to avoid them. You know, in Buddha's time, it would have been you know, India would have been elephants, lions, that sort of thing. So, in, in one sense, this is a teaching to remind us not to push ourselves too hard, not to just be stupid about it, where we just ignore our potential problems. If something is a potential problem, for some people sitting cross-legged can cause problems if they've had injuries, and you should avoid uh, exacerbating uh, injuries you've had, like people who have fused discs in their backs or have had operations on their knees. Sometimes it is better to uh, find an uh, alternative way to sit, for example. And of course, not to just be cavalier about going off into the forest or something. You know, be, be, be smart about it. Sometimes you have to be a little bit careful. Not paranoid, of course, but careful. But the other part of this one is avoiding situations. And this doesn't come up so much here, but um, it may, you may find yourself slipping into conversation. We already said to only talk when it's necessary. The only speech should be a speech that you have to say. But you might find yourself getting into a conversation, and these are the things you should avoid. Maybe you'll find your neighbor is chatty or so on, but you can do them a favor if you avoid them. Outside of here, of course, it would be things like avoiding people who are drunks or gamblers or uh, you know, party animals, that sort of thing. We don't have that here. But avoid situations that might cause problems. Avoid COVID, for example. Why we're wearing masks, I think, fits well into this. It's not that we're freaked out about the virus or afraid of getting sick. No, not at all. Sickness gets in the way of your practice. It can be useful as an object of meditation, but it saps your energy, uh, it clouds your, your mind, your brain. It, it has a deleterious effect. The Buddha himself said, when you're sick, it's a time when you really can't put out the same amount of effort. You can become enlightened through sickness. It can be a good object of meditation. But for a course like this, the requirements that are put on you if, if you got sick, when people do get sick during the course, it, it, it impacts their practice. So that's a good example of how we try to be vigilant in terms of protecting our practice. Not paranoid, not afraid by any means. Don't be afraid of getting sick. Crying out loud. It's just an experience, right? But uh, you thinking wisely, we try and avoid it. We do what 
it is reasonable to avoid it. But don't be afraid. Uh, number six is we know the nam pahatama. We know the nam means uh, removing. So there are some things that we should remove, get rid of. And these um, can probably be categorized as things like grudges, um, obsessions, paranoia, fear, uh, attraction. You know, sometimes in meditation centers, you find that your neighbor is kind of attractive. It's distracting. It's why we. Um, we do recommend, you know, in a, maybe in the future we can think about this, but we do recommend um, modest clothing and uh, you know, non-skin tight clothing. I mean, it's not, we're, we're not strict about it here, but um, it's just an example. Of, it can happen. But uh, here the, the point is, is that when you do experience that, job is to get rid of it, you know, to, to remind yourself, no, 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 because sometimes mindfulness is, uh, it needs a reminder, you have to remind yourself, okay, no, no, my, I'm going in this direction, being mindful, you know, because it'll get way beyond being mindful if you start to obsess and, and start to think, you know, you know, get very much attached, attraction, repulsion, I talked about this in the senses, right? It's the same idea. Get rid of your unwholesome thoughts, basically. Of, of uh, anger, grudges you might hold against people. Maybe your neighbor's annoying and it starts to build up and build up and suddenly it's a... You have to remind yourself. Sometimes you have to send good thoughts to your neighbor. You, know, you may be happy to help counteract the anger and allow you to be mindful. It's a supportive thing. mostly be hyper aware of your hindrances um, because if you let something else slip that you didn't know it well it's gonna be a it's not not good but the worst is when you let the hindrances slip liking disliking drowsiness distraction that when they slip they fester and this is the asana you start to leak and the cracks get bigger before you know you've got a problem. So be vigilant about uh, these kind of thoughts that become a train of thought that gets you distracted away from your practice. That's we know the nine. Number seven is called bhavana. If you know this word bhavana, you've probably heard it before. Many of you. Bhavana literally means development. Bhava, bhava is existence, but bhavana is becoming more. That's literally what it means. So it's the, way, the development, mental development, explicitly. Uh, becoming more than you are, bettering of yourself. So what is it that we are to cultivate? We are to cultivate these seven things that are called the bojangas. And I mentioned them yesterday, I think. The Bojangas are seven things that they're called the factors of enlightenment. They're like things that uh, constitute the enlightened state of mind. So if we can cultivate them properly, uh, we become enlightened. It's simple. And this is where I said Sati is the one that's special. So Sati is the base of the Bojangas. And so Here's another example if you're unsure of whether mindfulness is really what you should be practicing. It's the first and, and central of the seven factors of enlightenment. So it's definitely central. It's special. The Buddha himself said in the suttas, out of the seven, sati is the one that you always need. Because the other six, you have three on one side and three on the other side, and they have to balance each other. The seven bojangas are sati, which is mindfulness or remembrance, uh, vidya, which means effort, 
uh, or sorry, Namovichaya, uh, which means um, not exactly investigation, but the uh, kind of, no, the, well, let's say understanding of the Dhammas, of the simplest. Then Vidya, which means effort. And Viti, which means rapture. And these are the three on the energetic side. On the other side, you have Asati, which means tranquility. Samadhi, which means focus or concentration. And Upeka, which, upeka, which means equanimity. Six very good qualities, no? But they have to balance each other. And so sometimes you'll find you're, you're restless and, and overly energetic. So knowing about these bojangas will help you see that you're deficient. It, it, it really is used, what it's useful for, because you can't manually go around tweaking and saying, okay, I'm gonna pull this one up or push this one down and balance them. You use mindfulness to balance them, right? It's the balancing uh, quality. But in order to um, to realize the imbalance, it's useful to know about these seven qualities, the other other qualities, right? Because you can see, oh yes, I had very little effort, very little energy. So then you can know that you're tired. Uh, Dhammavichaya is the, the, it's almost investigation, but it's more like the, the uh, mind which understands good things, bad things. It's able to discriminate, in a sense. So this quality of awareness and, and really understanding the experience. And if that's lacking, right, if, if, you're, if you don't have this clear awareness, then you can see that you need to adjust that. You can say you're distracted, or if the mind is dull, you can say dull, or if it feels rather tired again, it would be to feel the mind is dull or unwieldy or so on. And piti. Piti is um, rapture, which really just means being enraptured with your practice. So piti is this, like getting in a groove, because as you practice continuously, you gain effort and you gain this clarity that is dhamma but you also gain a sense of um, competency or mastery. You get better at the practice, it becomes easier, it, it comes easier to you. So if nothing else, you can be confident as you start to gain proficiency practice comes easier and becomes more of a, uh, a habit as you gain more piti. That's what the meaning is here. Your mind becomes more inclined towards it, more keen on it. And on the other side, you start to gain basati, uh, tranquility. Your mind becomes calmer. Many of you have already started to comment on calm states that you didn't have before. So that's a sign that you're starting to balance this out. Maybe you were more restless before, and just by being mindful of that, it's helped to balance that out. You can see if you're not calm, then you know to note restless, restless, or anxious, or stressed, or so on. And focused, if you're not focused, then you would know distracted, distracted, because samadhi is one of the important factors. And finally, upeka. Upeka is, is uh, equanimity. And so it's a special one, in fact. It's, it's also quite special because uh, it, um, it stands in opposition to all of our judgments and reactions, right? Likes and dislikes. You know you're close to enlightenment when you no longer react to things. You no longer judge things no longer become upset by bad things or uh, excited about good things, where you're no longer pushed and pulled and stressed about 
what you do or don't have, what you do or don't experience. That's Upeka. Upeka is at the top. All of these, all seven of these are great qualities. But again, you don't go tweaking any one of them. You learn about them and it's useful to know, get a sense of where you're at. And probably, for those of you just starting out, you have a sense of, oh no, I don't have many of these at all. But don't be discouraged. Using mindfulness, you'll start to grow these. You'll start, you'll start to see them crop up. It's a great um, miracle in, in a way about this practice is that you see results. Maybe not the results you expected, maybe not um, what you hoped for, but you start to see. Right? You, start to, you start to see real effect. You're less reactionary. You're more equanimous. You're more focused. Uh, you're, you're, you're more wise. You have greater clarity of mind. It's a slow process, but it's a steady process. And that's what it means to cultivate. You know, to cultivate these things. And that is the Savasana Sutta. That is uh, one of the best uh, comprehensive teachings that I know of that the Buddha taught. That really gives you a complete idea of how a meditation training should go. So that's the Dhamma for today. Something more that I hope is useful for you during this course. Thank you. Have a good day.